Thank you very much. I really wish we were there in person. I've been looking forward to this conference for a long time. It's just great that note taking has become such a, a hot topic. So, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time when I was being asked for an abstract to say, oh, I'll do something synthetic. <laughs> and guess what? It causes some complications at the moments exactly like these. But actually, I'm, I'm delighted to have embraced what is a daunting prospect to try and take stock of the terrific range of studies we've heard about and we'll hear about tomorrow. And warmest thanks to Raf and Jan and all the organizers for bringing this to fruition despite all the obstacles and to all the speakers for a wonderfully exciting range of papers and for sharing their work generously with me. So my note-taking abilities have been put to the test and I count on all of you to give me feedback. And I'm just gonna offer a few thoughts for discussion informed by your talks and by some examples I've worked on, which as uh, Jan pointed out, tend to focus on French examples and natural philosophy. So our Renaissance rightly covers a wide chronological range. Our group ranged from 14th century study of poetry uh, with Professor Lo Sapio to 15th century humanists in Italian centers or in Ingolstadt down to notebooks from the Bruges Seminary in the 18th century with a wide lens on examples from Leuven that we'll hear about especially tomorrow from early 16th to 18th century and an extension to early modern New England as we heard this morning. Um, so it's a delight to see how this field is thriving, creating new resources for collaborative study and consultation, the websites you've got, the handbook and planning, and all kinds of new insights we can draw for these sources from different disciplines, classics, literature, linguistics, library and archival science, and history of many kinds, including history of art and of music. I may have forgotten some too. So I'm going to structure my remarks around four areas of historiography, that is areas of existing scholarship, to which research on student notes, I think, is making new contributions. The history of education, intellectual history, classical reception, and history of orality and book history. So first, the history of education. I think that's clearly one place where this field started. I'm remembering a 1981 article by Tony Grafton on the Feuille Classique of uh, Claude Mignot from the Paris College in the late 16th century. These notes are just wonderful sources to get us closer to what happened in the classroom. For so long, the history of education and of universities focused on regulations and curricula, archival sources, in other words, but student notes give us quite different insights, often with some discrepancy with the official rules. And I appreciated that, especially when I worked on uh, Jean-Cécile Frey. Here we are. Uh, a little graph here of, oh, sorry. Okay. Of his surviving um, works that I studied. So some are in print, two collections of all of these are only student notes. The, the two books were printed after his death by a group of students who conferred amongst themselves and published his opera and his opuscula. And then there were a few other, weird, there we go, a few other surviving manuscripts that I found. And they're pretty much evenly divided between what you would expect, which is courses in Aristotelian philosophy and subjects you would not expect on geography, on Lulian mnemonics, on the most ancient philosophy of the Gauls and other things that were certainly not in the curriculum. These are extracurricular courses, which probably happened pretty regularly in most universities in Europe in this time, but we often don't, they don't enter the archival record in the same way. And this morning we heard, this afternoon for you, we heard Daniel Garrett talk about another gap uh, between what we see in the notes and earlier assumptions we might have had about how students were supposed to go to the arts first and only later to the higher faculties. We see his students mixing um, levels of instruction in the courses they take and teaching earlier than what we'd expect the regulations to say. So um, there's a lot of new perspectives we can gain on the history of education, how it actually happened. And I was delighted to hear not only about student notes, but also about a teacher preparing for class, as Marc Lorais argued of the Houghton Manuscript of Juvenile of 1462. And uh, vivid in my mind on that uh, is the comment that Nicolas Nancel, who's a favorite student of Petrus Ramos in Paris at the Collège de Prelle, and who later became his assistant, who wrote a life of Ramos uh, decades later and reports that he would accompany Ramos to class where he stood next to him to hand him the books that he needed and to tug on his coat if he made a silly mistake. So that one view from the podium, what can we learn about teachers' experiences in the classroom 
from these notes, I think that's something we could probably emphasize more. And Patricia Osmond uh, also called to my attention uh, in a breakout room that uh, this, this practice of professors sharing the notes with students, i.e. in the uh, circuit of Pomponio that she studied, for example, but she reminded me of a similar observation made by Tony Grafton and Urf Loy in their study of annotations on the chronologia of Glarianus, that this was something that had been circulated from the professor to the students for copying. So history of education, obviously, is a major theme that um, this uh, conference sheds light on. The second would be the traditional perspective of intellectual history, which is another approach with a long pedigree. We look at manuscripts to understand the intellectual position or development of an individual or a school. So for example, how did Poliziano teach Aristotle's ethics, such as Luigi Silvano examined? And what do we learn from that about his um, philosophical commitments, his disciplinary commitments. Or we can look at institutions in a similar way. So Christophe Guidens and Lorenz de May tomorrow will use a set of commentaries on Aristotle's logic from Louvain circa 1500 to argue that the arts faculty there was not the bulwark of Via Antiqua, as we've always thought, and instead represents the Via Moderna of John Buridan. And then, of course, we have to ask whether this particular teacher was exceptional or representative of his colleagues, and that would require further examples to study. And a project that I've got in mind, but I don't think I'll ever get to it, frankly, if anyone of you is interested, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm waiting for the manu this manuscript to be digitized, which was brought to light by Marie-Madeleine Camper and Marie-Dominique Cousinet and Olivier Petflou, um, which is Nancel, the same Nancel who's the sidekick of Ramus, his notes from courses of Ramus on the left and Omer Talon, a close associate of Ramus's on the right. This is a Zamelband with a couple dozen texts and a mixture then of Ramus and Talon's lectures. And I just be, love to study these more and think about how, of course, they're quite traditional in a lot of ways. We see the interlinear paraphrase, we see the marginal commentary, and yet um, the layout of the marginal commentary is by call out into the margin and it has this sort of enumerative kind of list making look to it, not discursive the way we often see, uh, which strikes me as uh, interesting and worth pursuing. And then this argumentum, which was clearly dictated as a freestanding text uh, for, for each text, which may also be characteristic of a particular kind of pedagogy. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to this for a sec. So second, thirdly, we've got the story of classical reception and we've heard wonderful fine-grained analyses of exactly how the classical languages and texts were taught. Interlinear paraphrase. Is it suggesting a translation or a gloss of a hard word? But off, sometimes the interlinear paraphrase offers a harder word than the one in the text being commented. So maybe it's also sometimes an exercise in vocabulary building, like a thesaurus. You just want to come up with synonyms. Um, Martin Furneau commented that systematically signals an exemplum in Latomus's notes on Melanchthon's grammar. Is that a too an exercise, a way of practicing and doing it over and over again, even if it's repetitive, or possibly a way of finding things again? And then, of course, we have marginal notes keyed to the text with uh, underlining or capturing the lemma out in the margin or using call-out symbols, some use of vernacular in this way, too. A lot of glossing of unusual grammar, of rhetoric, of facts, of geography or mythology. Uh, and occasional references to other authors. So this is the feuille classique formula that is strikingly long lived and widespread. And I lost track of which speaker it was last week who commented that what's in manuscript painstakingly deciphered by the scholar often turns out to match the content of a printed book. And that's awfully disappointing. In many cases, it's a printed book that was the source for the note. Like we'll hear tomorrow about how the dictionaries of Calipino or of Gessner are used as tacit sources in Nanius's commentary on Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, in other cases, of course, the notes were the basis for a publication. And either way, we have to wonder, you know, what does the manuscript add to the printed record? What does each new set of notes add to the others? And Silvano concludes that the value of the notes is not great for philological purposes, but it does serve valuable historical ones. And I would agree. An area that um, I think is, uh, you know, burgeoning with activity is what I might call the history of orality. Uh, and we talked about sermons earlier today. 
they are a prime area of study for what was the oral experience. Of course, very hard to recapture. There is a nice website trying to recapture St. Paul's, um, a, a sermon by John Donne at St. Paul's, which you might've noticed online. So there are some attempts at, at recreating using digital methods, but of course we are left with the written record. Um, and, and throughout this conference, we've heard repeatedly about what we like to re reconstruct, which is an oral experience. So for example, what is the pace of the instructor speaking? The University of Paris famously banned dictation in the Middle Ages, but the ban was regularly repeated, which of course we can typically interpret as a sign that in fact dictation was used. Uh, one professor who is uh, brought to task for violating the ban on dictation explains that his students are too poor to pay for a copy of the text and therefore dictation seems to be his way of giving them a copy cheaply. Although you think he would be able to copy it quietly, but they might have had to rent it out if they were going to uh, copy it. Um, so dictation served a copying function really. Uh, and of course the um, the students were constantly complaining and wanting dictation, I think, and the ban was lifted at Paris in the 16th century, in which case we clearly get dictation, both of marginal annotations, as we've seen, and of freestanding notebooks. Uh, and occasionally we've been able to get two versions of the same course uh, from the same class, and you can see really how very, very similar they are, down to some oral mistakes and, and so forth. Uh, Yarek tomorrow will suggest that catchwords in the notes might be for reading aloud. Possibly. I was also thinking it's a way of imitating the printed book, which is something I'll get to uh, a bit later on today. Uh, we heard from Alexandra Baneu about students who are changing what they write as they write because they quote and they expect quad and then it doesn't become quad but something else and they have to change what they had started to write. Those are fascinating, fine grained you know, vivid examples of what the experience is of taking notes from orality. And I think we could do more there. I don't have brilliant ideas of what, but I hope we can all keep alert for those possibilities. Finally, my biggest section is going to be perspectives from book history. Uh, and, you know, basically, how can we find new stuff from sources which, as people have pointed out, can honestly be pretty repetitive and predictable? Uh, and, I, and I've learned tremendously from the observations and insights uh, gathered here today already. So I've got three subsections here, material bibliography, impact of printing, and the study of transmission and survival. So material bibliography, you know, as um, um, Martin Furneaux and uh, Anne Hélène Dolé pointed out, you know, we often are driving blind or have mostly blind. And basically the object itself in front of us is our best clue as to what was going on. We heard about parchment versus paper, that parchment was a medium for a teacher's copy, more expensive, but of course very durable to last a career. We've seen a lot of different practices and um, we talked to uh, Elizabeth Giselbrecht's work introduced me to musical annotations which I'd never uh, heard about. Um, I wonder about singing conjugations or declensions of which I experienced a few and I bet we probably most have some little jingle in mind too. Um, how far back can we take those, I wonder. Um, I have a, a little side interest in the uh, order of declensions and the different uh, European cultures having different orders. There's the Italian order, there's the French order, uh, there's the English order. Um, then there's the boom on shorthand, which uh, Teddy Didelwish spoke to the, earlier today and mentioned Kelly McKay. Both of them are working on shorthand in New England and Old England, respectively. And this is where I have something to contribute, which I haven't seen anywhere else, but in a few books that are at the University of Pennsylvania Rare Book Library. And it strikes me that what's going on here is some kind of highlighting that with the wet ink, a, a blurring to, of course it does make it harder to read, but it does also call attention to the sentence. I wonder if other people have seen such examples. Uh, and of course, it's sort of the, the, the uh, inventiveness of our, of our students is really remarkable. A topic I really enjoyed learning about was, you know, clues for distinguishing first order notes from second order notes, something that I've definitely struggled with. And a first takeaway that I think is very wise is that many notes present a mix and we shouldn't obsess with classifying, um, but you know, within a notebook, there will be some first order notes and second order notes mingled in. And we may need a category of third order notes, which would be copies of other people's second order notes. 
Alexandra Abeneu mentioned a variety of criteria. I love the one on the tendency for writing to become less compact over time. I, 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 that seems very reasonable. I'd like to keep that in mind more and, and see it pan out in practice. Also, many mentioned the use of abbreviations as a sign of first order notes, of leaving blank space to be filled in later. And Smets tomorrow is going to talk about the use of watermarks to show that different paper stocks were used, indicating that the writing took place at different stages, which I think is fascinating. Um, and uh, also notes that earlier manuscripts of the 15th and 16th centuries in her corpus are bigger in format, uh, quite considerably by a third. Uh, one of my current interests is in um, the cul de lampe or tapering arrangement. So here is a feuille classique. And it's interesting, for example, these feuille classique are very common in American rare book libraries. I showed you, well, I mentioned a Harvard one earlier. This one is from Princeton. And you can see, uh, obviously, a lot of, of uh, jollying up of title page. And then the young man gives himself a portrait with a laurel crown. And here on an interlinear page, he has done some very nice uh, sort of dispositions of his notes. And one question I have, especially coming from just giving a talk on paratexts and the layout of paratexts, where of course these are printers, compositors who are making those kind of tapered arrangements, they have a strong eye for knowing you know, where to break the line. Of course, if they make a mistake, they can redo it uh, before going to press. I'm wondering if this is something that could be done on the fly um, by you know, our, our professional students or the minute we see tapering like this, do we need to assume that these are second, second order notes? I don't know. Do we ever have first order notes on loose, as in when we have a second order note, do we ever have surviving first order notes? I've, I've read about such cases among the medievalists uh, who study reportaciones like Jacqueline Ames and others. Um, I've, I'm not sure I've encountered any from our Renaissance period, but I do have a nice example from the uh, Frankische Stiftungen in Halle, where uh, Hermann August Franke had an army of orphan boys, well-trained to do as they were told. And one thing they were evidently told to do was to take notes in teams during the sermon. So there are literally 200 volumes of sermon notes like this. And this particular, um, uh, you can see Ascension 1698, right around now, um, is unusual because it has a little footnote which says that the, um, the letters A and L are all that survive and the rest are missing. So there's some blank page and basically the transcription has stopped. And they actually put into the volume the slip number A, which you, these would be first order notes of which the volume is the, the clean copy. And you can see here one, two, three, one through 10 sentence fragments. The idea being that student A has managed to take this much full text and then student B takes the next full text, C on down the line and you've got L, which makes for 16 um, different students doing this from which you piece together the sermon. So that's obviously an exceptional environment, uh, exceptionally elaborate way of at no effort, the, the sermon giver doesn't have to have any notes, but he will get a full text version of his notes as a result of the oral delivery. A couple other material questions I've got about binding. Um, when does it happen? So we've heard from some people it clearly is happening after most of the notes are taken, but they've got interleaved sheets. Have the interleaved sheets been integrated into the binding and then they are annotated or were they annotated and then bound? Um, I can imagine a fair amount of stress of organizing the notes with your interleaved sheets and maybe even just some not full sheets, but slips of paper. It's a serious investment of time and money and attention to create this bound volume. I think sometimes extra slips can be glued in, but clearly many times they are bound in too. We know that. So um, it's a great question of, you know, when exactly does this binding happen? Uh, uh, I think it's Yarek van der Beest who's going to have a nice example tomorrow about a long delay of three years between the notes, the first order notes and the, the binding. Um, and then more notes are added into the bound volume. So we know, of course, that the bound volumes survive much better. Uh, and presumably, only a minority of notes were bound, perhaps. Um, can we estimate the percentage of notes uh, that were bound and surviving? Um, but it's also fascinating to me that there are clusters 
of surviving notes. I mentioned the Feuille Classique of late 16th century Paris. There's also the wonderful cluster that Jürgen Leonard has studied in early 16th century Leipzig. Why do we have, you know, really literally dozens from certain environments and then nothing or very little from other environments, even though presumably very similar methods were being used. So that's binding. Then there's also preparing the paper for note taking. So we know that um, you, you would size paper, pro, treat it with simply a gel that helps it grab the right amount of ink. You size paper for printing and you size paper for letter writing differently. Um, and so how, how exactly is paper prepared? Are the margins prepared for taking notes? And here I've got a great quote. Uh, my attention was brought to this by uh, Nicolas Fabry de Peresque, of whom Gassendi writes that he commonly caused all his books when they were in choirs, that is before binding, to be washed over with alum water, eau d'alum. And when he foresaw their margins would not be wide enough, he caused white paper to be bound between the printed leaves. When he received any observations from his friend, he wrote them into his books with his own hands uh, or, or uh, caused his friends or some others to write them in. So basically, he is preparing his bound books even before binding in order to be ready to take annotations in the margins. How much, how much are the students worrying about this? I don't know. So that's my material uh, cluster. My second cluster is the impact of printing. Obviously, note-taking has a very long history. And how did the uh, arrival of printing change it? I would say one huge relief for me is that you can finally distinguish production of manuscript from reception of, manus of, of a text much more clearly. In the Middle Ages, it's not clear always what's an annotation by the producer versus by the user. And in particular, not only is there a scribe and a, a rubricator, but there might also be a so-called professional reader, as uh, studied by Kirby Felton, for example, where the professional reader is going through annotating the text in order to make it easier of access to the ultimate reader who's commissioned this treatment to it. So then, you know, it gets quite confusing. And of course, the production is constantly ongoing if you look at the final product, which would be true in printing too, but at least printing has a very closed uh, circuit of the first production of the printed book. And then you see manuscript added on, uh, which might be, you know, corrections of errata, possibly done in the print shop, but very rarely, mostly that's user annotations. So in the pre-print era, of course, you either made a copy yourself or you paid someone to make a copy or you purchased it used. And uh, came up last week, uh, the great expense of, greater expense certainly of Greek scribes. And I can imagine Hebrew scribes would be even more rarefied. Um, and of course, I think the printing of Greek and Hebrew was also more expensive. So just accessing the text in those languages would be a further challenge. Um, so did printing change the practice of copying out a text that you comment on, which would be the medieval norm? And definitely yes. Although I would point out that we also have cases of manuscripts copied from printed books in special circumstances. I went down this particular rabbit hole uh, at one point and when I was visiting the Rylands Library in Manchester and have a few nice examples from their collection, thanks to their librarians. Uh, here, for example, is a familist track. So it's Dutch in origin. It was forbidden in England. It's published anonymously by H.N. Hendrik Nicholas. And um, this is a manuscript copy, very complete. You can see with all the bits of the title page and all the bits of the ending, um, which was you know, presumably the safest way to get yourself a copy of this text. It certainly would not have been for sale and you wouldn't have wanted to um, you know, seem to own it. Another more sort of strange example maybe of a uh, manuscript in the age of print. This is a late 17th century parchment manuscript of Lucretius, which is hardly a devotional text. I mean, books of hours, fine. But maybe there is some kind of, uh, obviously, special attention lavished on this text, uh, known for its poetic beauty um, and, and usually disapproved of for its philosophical content. But um, perhaps holding special significance of some kind. You can see the um, scribe has signed off. And interestingly, online, I found a recent uh, sale of another book that this scribe had written also on parchment. Um, 
So we can see that um, the production of manuscripts outside the classroom context, of course, does persist even when books would have been, these texts, of course, were available in print. So I, I'd like to uh, mention a work that I found quite inspiring, Colette Sira, Writing as Handwork, uh, A History of Handwriting in Mediterranean Western Culture. And I don't think there was a French original. It seems like it came out in English only. And basically, she has a, a story of the long arc of a status of handwriting. And her argument is that printing, perhaps paradoxically, raises the status of handwriting. Because in a way, printing can take over the mechanical reproduction function and can handle a lot of the grunt work of copying. And then handwriting comes to seem more special. Uh, there are also a couple of very pragmatic factors, which she certainly mentions too, which is scribes are going out of business. And one of the ways they make business for themselves in the age of print is to publish books, printed books, describing the art of scribing and all the handwritings they can do and touting their book and their services as a live teacher as essential to the gentleman. That handwriting is not something that you can just delegate to, to others as many elites had clearly in the middle ages where composition is by dictation and maybe you needn't learn to write if you're a king or a nobleman, you always have someone to do it for you. And at the same time, we've got uh, coming from the humanist pedagogues, people like Erasmus and Vives, and here Erasmus is touting the importance of handwriting as a humanist skill, basically. And it's fascinating that he's blaming on the art of printing the fact that people don't write anymore, and if they write, they can't read their handwriting anymore. So, so printing is killing handwriting, and he is saying, on the contrary, we need handwriting. A man's handwriting, like his voice, has a special individual quality. Uh, and, and so an autograph letter is much more meaningful than one by your secretary, for example. So printing made it possible for each student to have a printed copy then of the text under, whether it's a, a grammar book or an Ovid or whatever that's being commented on, uh, and then they can annotate in class. Ray Schreer has emphasized how this change made, had, had impacts on the cognitive skills that were inculcated in schoolboys. It wasn't an immediate one, but it happened over a few generations, especially after the teachers had been raised with printed school books themselves became teachers. Um, but as someone pointed out last week too, the students still did a tremendous amount of handwriting and it was considered good for you, good for your paying attention at the time, good for retaining the material later on, good for self-discipline. Vives talks about chasing away uh, unchased thoughts from it. I'd like to know more about how you access this printed book. Um, so we've heard from Maximilian Shu on the rules in 15th century English. Doc, no more than three students can share a copy of a book. Obviously, this is a period of Incunabula, where the books are still quite expensive. It reminds me, though, of Bartholomew Keckerman in the early 17th century recommending group study in groups of three of similar ability level and who are friendly with one another. And that's how you should read and take notes uh, in a group. Over time, of course, books become cheaper. And basically, the assumption is one per student. Uh, so these small format books were produced locally. In how many copies? Sold for how many years? What print run? Are teachers putting in the order? Is there some kind of kickback uh, with um, who they go with if there are multiple options as there would be in Paris, for example? Uh, it reminds me of uh, being a faculty member at University of California, Irvine a few decades ago and voting as a department to enjoin the campus bookstore to buy a certain percentage of new books. The idea being to help the authors of said books combat you know, the encroachment of the used book market, which of course people have completely given up on now. Um, and interesting, I mentioned that earlier that Harvard College in the 18th century required students to buy each a new Hebrew grammar once it was printed in 1735. Again, make sure that the printer is able to sell his copy. And I wonder what kinds of deals there are going on um, that have only left the tracks of, of these annotated books. We'll hear more tomorrow about the Leuven bookseller Chloe, uh, Clout, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, any further details would be very welcome. Uh, I gather that Rescius uh, was a professor who became a printer, but that that sort of killed his professorial um, career. So I'd be curious about the interconnections there. And uh, so after this notion that every student has a printed book, I was fascinated to learn that in Leuven, an archducal visitation of 1617 
forbade the reliance on print texts. So what happened? I returned to the manuscript course book. Um, and, or, yeah, I, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and was this ban lifted at some later point? What motivated the ban? Uh, was the ban transformative intellectually? Uh, when I was working on uh, Jean-Cécile Frey, who, who is dictating freestanding course books, not annotating a printed book, um, I was struck by the comment by Francois Danville, who said that the departure in Jesuit colleges from commentary on assigned texts to freestanding courses dictated by the master was, quote, the pedagogical expression of a revolution which gave birth to Descartes. So somehow this creating a freestanding text is really about throwing off, you know, the hidebound co commentary form, although we know that commentary can be extremely innovative also. So I'm not entirely convinced that this would stand up to current scrutiny, but it's still a thought provoking um, message really that, that the freestanding notebook is, is something quite different from the annotation of a printed book. So could we come up with a quantitative assessment of when and where that transition to the freestanding course happened? To what extent was the shift linked to place and change over time, but also maybe just to the age of the student? So the Feuille Classique maybe is mainly for the propedeutic co college, similar to those schools that Daniel Garrett was discussing before they really get to university. And then the dictated freestanding philosophy course is what you do at university. I don't know. Uh, so my current, um, my current obsession has been the freestanding notebooks of Jean-Robert Chouet of the Academy of Geneva. Interestingly, his, none of his uh, works were published until the 21st century, 2010. Um, so along with Anya Sylvia Goering, I've looked at the eight surviving manuscripts of his physics, which range from Saumur 1667 on the left to uh, Geneva 1685. And we had a long time, Anya was brilliant in noticing the date inside this little decorative border. Uh, so that was definitely took a sharp eye. You, you just, I had looked at this, you know, looking for a date uh, for a long time without seeing it. So there's nothing like looking closely. Um, and here are some examples of the notebooks in Geneva, where you can see that basically the student has a lot of leeway in the format, uh, in how the stuff is bound, of course. Uh, although some may have involved rebinding. Um, and so as usual, there's a lot of personalization that goes on. We don't have any professorial manuscripts and the bottom line about the changes that he made is there are, aren't a whole lot of them. He did make some changes in the ordering of the material, a few changes in the examples he offered, a bit more discussion of motion later on in the, the later versions than in the first versions of his course. But we don't know anything about how he changed his course. Did he write it all out again? Did he annotate his own manuscript? Did he make changes on the fly? I don't know. So one of the fun parts of uh, these materials is to watch how students make their manuscripts look like printed books. On the one hand, we know, of course, that printing imitates manuscript. But here we have manuscript imitating print and personalize it. So here we have you know, divisions of the chapters. We have an index or table of contents. We have uh, some decorative elements. Uh, here's a, this is an ethics, but uh, beautifully uh, decorated. And we have the most elaborate set of all is what turns out to be by um, the most famous of Chouet's students, uh, Facio de Duillier, who went on, who moved to England, who became an exceptional natural philosopher, mathematician, close friend to Isaac Newton. So what we have in Geneva are three of the four parts of the Aristotelian philosophy course that he took with Chouet from 1678 to 80, when he was 14 to 16 years old. We can see here something not quite finished, probably meant to write something in enormous care taken. Obviously, these are second order, and I can imagine him throwing out some things that he felt weren't good enough. Um, a beautiful tree of porphyry here. Uh, and here is a, an index, which is really a table of contents, including page numbers. I haven't yet found an alphabetical index to a course book, which is interesting. Um, and here we see the student basically interacting with um, the vernacular world, which also he lived in, of course. So this is a frontispiece to, you can see Syntagma Logicum et Metaphysicum Chouet, 79. 
And it is an imitation of this um, imprint, which was also Anya's find, was you know, beautifully changed. Of course, the language uh, added in an owl, added in a biblical reference here, and got rid of some of the uh, more martial elements um, that would appeal to a king, uh, but less to the student. And I'm curious to what you think about whether we, this Mercure Galant, which was one of the most widespread uh, sort of news um, of the world, the Salon world circulating at the time, and this way of having a special uh, font might have inspired this particular form of decorative uh, font in this manuscript. It may be too far-fetched. Um, right. So now and my final point, and I'll wrap up very soon though, is the question of survival. Multiple people have addressed this question and emphasized how random it is that we have some student or teacher's notes, but not others. But it's not completely random. I hope we can identify maybe some biases. Notes survive better when they're bound. Do they survive better when it's uh, notes in a book that was saved because it was a printed book and happened to have mar marginal notations, Or when it's saved for the manuscript, it might be cataloged as a manuscript, it, um, or of course it might be a freestanding manuscript as we saw. Manuscripts no doubt survive better when they are aesthetically pleasing. Images, color, uh, high production value, as we saw with the Facio de Duillier examples. Some courses may have seemed more valuable to their owners and be better saved as a result. We've heard about, you, you know, uh, Maximilian Chu reminded us that uh, Jürgen Leonard found that rhetoric courses were especially desirable, or logic courses survive better than others because, uh, you know, they came earlier in the career and they were considered to be useful later on. Theological manuscripts might have been of, of greater value to those entering religious orders, physics courses for those studying medicine, as Anne Smets emphasizes. Or maybe it's the course book that's most used that doesn't survive. So of the Facio de Duillier, the, the fourth part that we're missing is actually the physics, which of course is what he ended up specializing in. Maybe he took it with him to England where it has become lost or maybe not yet identified, you know, left behind at home, the stuff we didn't care about, the ethics, et cetera. So it's just a reminder that saving and losing are just complicated in their interactions. Um, and can we ever extrapolate from surviving manuscripts to lost ones? Probably not very well, but I think it's worth thinking about. Uh, Max Xu explained why so many course books ended up in monasteries or prior libraries because members had to give up their possessions on entering. And Violet Stone similarly noted transmission of manuscripts in monastic contexts, which are, of course, long lived institutions, even though they often spilled into other durable re repositories like uh, national or local libraries. And a fascinating example of the Gerhardina collection, which seems to include his manuscript, but those of his father in law, and then others that he paid for which reminds us that there is plenty of selling of people's annotated books for the sake of the annotations. This is visible uh, in, in uh, discussions and in, in auctions and how they're presented, how the items are presented. And of course, the best way to save your stuff is to found a library. And I just love this series of uh, annotated books showing the schoolwork, though it was probably not in a classroom, but one-on-one -on -one with the private tutor, of uh, August de Braunschweig, who founded the Herzog August Bibliothek. So here we see the underlining, we see the Sentenzensammlung copying them out in order under, this is Cicero, I think. And then we have the Loki Communes, which gets kind of out of hand, which has its uh, sapientia sui intelligentia. And then uh, he has recopied over uh, in a variety of fonts with much less discipline, um, things under headings. And then sometimes he has blank space because uh, he didn't have much to fill there. And I'd just like to close with an example from Harvard, which contains a number of uh, student manuscripts uh, composed by copying a teacher exemplar. So this is not by dictation. This is Charles Morton's Compendium of Physics. He brought it over from England. And students would be assigned to copy it out in chunks, as has been studied by uh, Thomas Knowles and Lucia Zalka Knowles. And you end up with notebooks that look different, different formats, different on the inside, how they're organized, though it's the same text. Um, and we have colofa and title, title pages, and we have indexes. And in this case, we have an accompanying letter, which I love. This man is writing in December 1909, and he says, I send you a college notebook with the scribblings written by obviously an ancestor of his, Jonathan Trumbull. It has, of course, no value except as a curiosity. And this is just a reminder of how much we owe to institutions who have saved stuff 
that was considered to be useless at the time they came in. And now, of course, more than 100 years later, here we are obsessed with student note taking, and suddenly we can find new merit in these objects. So just to, to close, I would say um, there are a variety of purposes that these books served at the time. What purposes can they serve for us? I see a lot of convergence on the history of practices. It's basically a new way of talking about widely shared assumptions and techniques. It's related to cognitive, intellectual, and material contexts. And I think we're aware of technologies now that they are dying. A handwriting, at least in the experience of my students, is, is really um, a rarefied, a very rare experience. And, and our students can no longer read handwriting, even of our own, you know, let alone paleography. And so perhaps that's one reason why um, I think these practices, you know, these uh, these sources are very vivid to students. They they uh, takes them, it puts them in a long tradition, and also is also alienating in various ways. A particular topic that I think is really uh, of uh, very exciting right now is collaborative practices, and how many people can we perceive through the notes we study? There's the teacher's voice, there's the student's voice, there are peers. We've talked about the sharing of books and notebooks, students copying from other students, uh, religious houses using notes, notes crossing generations. And I think there's also a potential for quantitative work, for comparative work. Uh, some desiderata, as have been mentioned, are controlled vocabulary. The actors categories are complicated, but ours are too. We, we need to try and figure this out and I think we could be exploring private holdings in the rare book market because there are clearly lots of student notebooks around there. They come up for sale regularly. Um, so it's an exhortation to experiment, to enjoy the sources, to keep in touch with the questions that are emerging in the different subfields. The idea that these notes can help to investigate a variety of questions that, um, that we haven't thought of before. A couple of cutting edge areas in book history, for example, are studying the DNA of parchment to find out what animal they're from, the patterns of bookworms, uh, to see about where a book might have been stored or whether it's been rebound, and many other great topics that um, I look forward to hearing about from all of you. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. So thank you, Anne, for this uh, wonderful uh, survey, a panoramic view and a rehearsal with a view on the future. I'm sure people took notes while you were uh, talking about them. And uh, I invite you to ask questions, if any, or to uh, add uh, your own views to the ones uh, uttered uh, so far. Okay, Martin. The sound. Uh, wait. Voilà. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hi, uh, yes, I have a short question. And first, um, you you don't have the answer, but I don't know. Perhaps anyone has the answer. Uh, it's about conservation, uh, the conservation of these um, materials. Uh, you said, of course, we, we cannot know why uh, some books uh were uh kept um and and other one no why we we have lost uh, some and and not uh others but when when we have kept them um uh this that means that the owner uh kept uh his his own um copy uh, and and uh, what was the purpose? Uh -huh. um, wh when you are um, an old man <laughs> or an old woman uh, far away from, uh, from your, your studies, uh -huh, what do you do with an old book, or with, 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 a, with a grammar for beginners, um, uh, as, uh, as we see in the, the grammar of Melanchthon uh, with notes of Latomus? Uh, what do you do with that? Do you keep yeah. just for memory? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And I think uh, it has come up a bit. Obviously, at a, sort of, for a certain time, it might be useful in your professional life. You might want to refer back to it in later studies. But you're right. You, you are making the decision to save 
you could be making it multiple times over time. Basically, every time you move, that's the modern experience. I think you have to ask yourself, do you want to move this with you or not? <laughs> um, maybe there was a less mobile culture so they could accumulate things. I think too, though, these are objects, you know, to which of, of beauty, they're sort of badges of achievement. They are um, uh, signs sometimes, you know, like Pierre Grillon annotating at Amicorum. Um, and, and we'll hear tomorrow uh, about beautifully illustrated ones uh, where things have been tipped in with uh, colored images. Um, so I think it's sort of a badge of belonging, a, uh, a reminder of, of achievement, a sign to others perhaps. And then of course it could be an heirloom. It's something you, you hand down to your children. Uh, I think we, we, we've seen a few cases of that. Um, and obviously the ban against uh, buying rare, uh, used books is partly, you know, obviously the students don't share with each other, but possibly also that, that it doesn't come down in the family. So that's a great question. I agree. Uh, and you're, it's true. I mean, the question is, I suppose, it's different if it just sat, you know, in, in every family generation along the way had to decide to keep it too. Um, and fascinating, you know, this Mr. Trumbull's descendant who decides that it's useless, but instead of just throwing it out, he took it to Harvard University. Um, and of course, what he has done in effect is given himself a, 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 some, some longer life, you know, because now he's ended up in my PowerPoint. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, thank you. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, please. Well, thank you. I was uh, actually going to make a point that follows up directly on this uh, because what is clear from my study of lectures and student notebooks in Bologna is that you have several cases in which notebooks are passed on throughout the generations. And even something put together in the 1480s being used still by someone else in the 1570s, for instance. Uh, very yeah. interesting. Uh, so you do mm -hmm. have these instances, uh, but I don't think that's incompatible with the idea also of the treasured uh, badge of honor that you were mentioning, Anne. Uh, you find this in Italy quite often still today. If you go to into any home, you'll find people's um, notebooks from when the children were in primary school. They're still being preserved. And of course, again, the that question comes up, well, what for? Uh, but they're still there. Um, so uh, there's a culture of respect for the teachers. Well, sorry, there was a culture of respect <laughs> yeah. for the, the teacher's activity, at least when I was a, 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 a teenager. Uh, very, mm -hmm. very striking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a question for you, Anne, as well, because one of the points that you raised quite rightly was that of the extent to which subjects, uh, notebooks and various subjects are are preserved versus others. Mm -hmm. And what's what I've come across for Italy and Grendler uh, says the same is that what's uh, really remarkable is that we have hardly any student notebooks for rhetoric, hardly any. Mm -hmm. uh, reconstructing Filippo Beroaldo's teaching in Bologna is hugely difficult. The only uh, reportatio that I know of is uh, guarda caso, we would say, by a German student. You know, and why is this? I mean, are students writing in the margins of printed books, which then got lost? Is there a reason for the very low survival rate of these humanities lectures? I don't know if you have any insights into that point at all. I'm afraid not. Is that says, yeah. But I love the idea of the transmission. I'd love to hear more about the 100 year long reach. It, it does speak to the continuity of education, um, which makes that possible. Yeah. And the cultural phenomenon. And one other point would be the self fashioning, the way Pierre Grillon has a portrait of himself. You know, it, it's, of course, every, you know, teenagers do that now too. Um, and who knows what they're saving, some kind of healthy or something. But um, yeah, thank you. Great. First, Jesus and then Anna. So, Jesus, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, such a 
a uh, pedagogical uh, lecture, as always. Um, I'd like to uh, go back to one of the points I think you um, very nicely uh, pointed out in your lecture, which is uh, the material text aspect of this research, and particularly provenance. And I, I feel that provenance can shed an important light uh, to, to some paths or a, avenues of this research. And if I can just give a, a very specific example, um, drawing on um, unstudied, unexplored materials from colonial Mexico, I realized that there is one first problem, which is you can't know out of the catalogs that uh, the particular manuscript, because I'm, I'm talking of manuscripts right now, uh, was part of the curriculum. So you really need to put like curricula, cultural history, and the actual book together to even realize that it feel that it uh, matches to 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 this kind of material. Yeah. Uh, that's, if you allow me, more a comment than a question. Uh, landscape, intellectual landscapes such as colonial Latin America, or perhaps uh, early modern Asia with uh, Europeans interaction of all sorts may perhaps open up uh, some interesting avenues of research. Of course, it's difficult. Access to these libraries are difficult. I, I, I've even come across these kind of materials in the States rather than in Mexico, Peru, Chile, or Argentina. But that's, that's something that may, may perhaps um, just help um, opening up these fields. And thank you again. Thank you. That's a wonderful point. And actually it brings to mind a recent book by Stuart McManus about humanism in all kinds of uh, colonial environments, particularly in the Spanish world. And it's a really wonderful uh, area. And I'm delighted to hear that there are untapped resources, even though they are difficult of access. I'm sure they're well worth the, uh, <laughs> the struggle. <laughs> I look forward to learning more about that. Thank you. Okay. Allah, please. The sound. Uh, hello. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. It was very, very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask about the manuscripts you mentioned. There are a copy of the actual printed book. They are clearly made. You said they were clearly made based on the actual printed editions. And I wanted yeah. to ask, uh, besides the printed text itself, did they, they add comments or other margin notes that were beyond or correcting content? It's just a co literal copy. I ask this because I have some in which I'm kind of, some of my uh, research in Leuven that I'm kind of suspicious to be a copy of the book. Or, well, I don't know if it's a earlier or, and I would like to know your experience to compare. Thank you. Yes, that's a great point. I'll, I'll confess that the way I got started on this was because Harvard has a bizarre hand copy of a, it says 18th century hand, it looks like, of a late 15th, 16th century printed book, complete with catchwords, foliation, the whole bit, you know? And what is this? And um, so at first I was thinking, well, could this be, you know, the printer's manuscript, but the handwriting doesn't, doesn't, not, not possible. So it's very complicated. And um, ultimately I, I don't have a good explanation, but making a copy of something when it's not for sale and you know you can't convince the person who has the copy that you're copying to sell it to you or you don't want to, you know, ultimately that is how you get stuff in the absence of a copier and digital photography and all the other tools we have. So trying to decide whether it's pre-print or post-print, um, obviously a close comparison with the printed version uh, sounds important. You know, copies, the printer's copy typically does not survive because it was marked up, the compositor marked it up with, you know, where the quiring is and page numbers and things like that. And often struck through pa passages that were composed. I've got some examples from Gessner's Nachlas where we have a, a few pages. And of course the Plantin Moretas archive has a fair number of that kind of material, which is really rare otherwise. But you could have a pre, you know, this could be a scribal copy before the copy that was used by the printers. Um, and in that case, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're stuck with all the kinds of circumstantial evidence you can find, you know, what does the hand look like and the paper watermarks, you know, that might help. Um, but it's fun. It sounds great. Mm -hmm. This is a Leuven, a Leuven manuscript. 
Yes, yes, by Professor of uh, Andreas Valencius, canon law. So it could be a student taking notes or it could be a professor's um, notes. Uh, it actually yeah. has the signature of the student, but I'm still not sure it's, if it's uh, with aid from the printed source or before. So right. still a lot of research to do in this. <laughs> yes, that sounds fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see no further questions. I'm sure. Ah, Xander, there he is. Uh, it's not really a question, but rather uh, me agreeing with what you said at, at the end that uh, uh, it's 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 very important not to forget that a lot of annotated books and manuscripts, etc., are still in private collections, um, and that we really have to look out for these uh, on the market as well. It's something that I do almost daily uh, myself. Uh, just it takes only ten minutes, but it it it. Almost every every month, there's something interesting that I see passing by. But unfortunately, I don't have enough money to buy uh, all the books yes. I want. Uh, <laughs> but it it just uh, makes me think of a quote my professor of, of one of my professors of Greek said. Uh, he always said so. I oh, he said it a few times that everything we know about antiquity can be written on the back of a post-it note for certain. So everything that we know for certain about antiquity can be written on, on just a post-it note. And actually the same goes uh, for a sense about uh, uh, student notes because there's only a very small percentage that we, that we know of. Uh, uh, I, I don't think we really imagine how many papers or books were filled in all those ages. And uh, it's just something to take into account. So that's, that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, thank you. That's a great, great point. Now, when you see something going across the rare book market, one idea would be to ask if you could have some photos, either posing as a potential buyer or... Yeah, or, or there just... are a few additions. Each, I think Ray also said it, if he, if he sees a, 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 a specific book that he always um, emails for pictures. And I also have a few editions if I see them passing by, I always yeah. ask for pictures. You never know. Yeah. 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 Nice. I see a hand by Mark and Patricia, if I'm not mistaken. So Mark was first, if uh, you agree. Mark, please go. No, no, no. And uh, actually, Patricia has raised her hand since uh, quite some time already. Oh, so sorry. It was, no, was a, a, come after her. But the virtual hand was a real hand. No, no, it was always the real hand, exactly. Uh, Patricia, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, you raised so many interesting questions, or just a few that I wanted to touch upon very briefly um, on the basis of my own limited experience, but in terms of Pomponio, uh, Leto, and Roman collectors, Roman libraries. First of all, I would say that there are dozens of, of um, classical authors annotated by Pomponio and or his students. And so there, in terms of survival, um, that is uh, uh, quite remarkable. I would say that in many cases, at least based on what I have seen of the, these copies of Sallust, that the owners and annotators considered them, I think you used the word, um, uh, well, um, it, it, they considered them I think you use the word heirloom. They considered them, in other words, as a kind of legacy of the scholar and his teaching. It was a kind of tribute to him to keep right. his books and pass them on. Um, one other, a couple of other things. That 1515 Leipzig Salus that you saw, I believe there's another annotated copy of that at the Beinecke. Uh, I'll look it up and if it is the same date, um, I'll send you the, the shelf mark on that. Um, in terms of parchment, the use of parchment, um, we know that um, sometimes teachers who were uh, teaching privately as tutors to uh, children of very important or wealthy families would personally write and annotate a copy as Pomponio did for the young Fabio Mazzatosta in Viterbo. And those 
those are magnificently written and, and illuminated, which he did not do. That was um, they were done by Bartolomeo da San Vito. So either as presentation copies um, when a first edition came out, or as copies for a very special and gifted student. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank That's you. a great point about the printed presentation copies could be printed on parchment too. I had, yes, you know, they could either print it or out by written hand, by it? hand. And, or written and, by hand. Um, and Giacomo Aurelio Questenberg, who was one of the leading scribes at the time, um, he wrote the presentation copy of Pomponio's 1490 edition that was dedicated to Agostino Maffei. And that's in the Vatican, a beautiful copy. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Beauty always wins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's uh, being said, Mark, we pass on to you. You win. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you very much. Uh, and yes, uh, I have a more general question, actually. Uh, you know, when I listened to your presentation, I uh, thought uh, all the time about um, continuity and innovation between Middle Ages and, and, and the early modern period, you know, because in all the areas you, you, you singled out, um, uh, as being of special interest, you have similar questions, problems, phenomena also already in the Middle Ages. And so my question would be, uh, in your judgment, um, well, to what extent do we need actually to, to, uh, to assume continuity of medieval traditions into the Renaissance? To what extent can we really say that uh, what we are discussing now is something new? Um, or should we perhaps include, and that I'm now playing also the devil's advocate towards the organizers, uh, to what extent actually we need to uh, take into account also uh, these um, uh, yeah, medieval reportationes, note-taking uh, practices, uh, questions of layout, etc. all the things you mentioned actually. Uh, so of course the big change between the Middle Ages and the, uh, and the early modern period is of course the material aspect. I mean the, the change from manuscripts to printed books and that has a number of implications. But apart from that, um, I would uh, be interested in knowing your views on, on uh, how, to, how to assess uh, continuity and change between in, in, in the, uh, the topic that we're discussing between Middle Ages and the early modern period. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm a big fan of continuities, and clearly there are so many of them, uh, you know, when it comes, you know, too much to know or indexing or layouts, and as you say. Um, so how do you, but, but there are, there are difficulties in the, the communities involved. Um, you know, I just read medievalist writings. Um, they have been at the forefront of vocabulary of, of intellectual work. We had this citation that I learned about last time, but also a mess and, um, uh, and the, the whole Vincent de Beauvais crowd also been very active with that. So that's great. I think I, yes, I'm, I'm all in favor of. Uh, more more communication and um, I wish I wish I were in more direct contact of course I have medievalist colleagues here at Harvard but they're not into note taking so <laughs> um, and what to say I, I also think their continuities down to now you know and and that's of course what appeals to so what, with the so what question you know we all struggle with it um, and when we speak to students or you know broader audiences I try try to, to make it resonate with things people are experiencing now. So I teach a course called Texts in Transition, which is about how texts came down and were changed. And of course, how they're going down now. What will digital texts look like in a hundred years? Good luck with that, you know? You realize, so, and, and of course, handwriting is one of those things that people have, are really losing touch with. And um, so I think there's, there's good potential. I, I'd like to see continuities at, at some basic level, you know, this is the, you're, you're, you're doing a mental act, which has been around a long time. You know, you're trying to retain something which in, it involves making it your own. And, and writing of course has been around, of course now we might type it, um, but we still think that the, the act of typing it uh, might carry, it slows you down. It makes you think, it gives you something to return to. So how do how do do comparative work? I, yes. So yes, yes. And um, and then the question is, when do these things die? You know, when does the feuille classique die? In some sense, you know, it hasn't. It's just been reformulated because, of course, you read Virgil, you're still going to get comments of the kind that you know they were making that even Servius was making. You know, and then and then the, our humanists were making. Um, 
I suppose that's what continuity really is, is the canon. I mean, and, and then we, and I do worry about that canon. You know, we, we, we've been running on the, re, on the Renaissance for a long time, but it, 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 it's, <laughs> the steam is, is uh, slowing yeah. in the worlds I, I live in. And that's, of course, the, one of the points though, is that what's made these texts so durable is that they have been reinvented and reinterpreted and remade to serve and to seem relevant and good. And uh, I think we can do that some more, but, but it takes some work. And I, I feel we're at a, a stage where, um, yeah. Anyway, so that's where that ultimately there's culture, there's material continuity, but what really counts is cultural continuity. And of course, religion is the other main area that has managed to pull off uh, long range cultural continuity. And then, and then the Greco-Roman classics in the European tradition um, with some a hiatus, you know, various hiatuses. Yeah. But let's just hope we don't are not, aren't on the, on the cusp of a hiatus right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with this uh, wonderful uh, end note, uh, we may uh, conclude our long day to start tomorrow with another new day, not before thanking very warmly our speaker, Anne Blair, who uh, uh, treated us enormously and uh, very generously with all our thoughts and our gift of uh, and our talent of uh, making up a synthesis out of this. So very warm thanks, Anne.